Again, I'm Catherine Kinney. I'm from the English department here at UCR, um, and I'm very pleased to be moderating our third and last session, uh, State of the Field, Actors of Color on and Off Stage and Screen. Um, so I'll introduce our speakers as they come up. One of these is on my phone. Okay. Um, so our, our first speaker um, is Anna Christina Ramon, who is the Director of Research and Civic Engagement for the Division of Social Sciences at UCLA. Dr. Ramon is a social psychologist who has worked on social justice issues related to equity and access in higher education and the entertainment industry for over 10 years. Pro um, she is the co-principal investigator of the Hollywood Advancement Project and manages its graduate research team. She's the co-author with Dr. Darnell Hunt of the annual Hollywood Diversity Report series that the project produces. She's also managing editor of LA Social Science, an e-forum that showcases the vibrant and cutting edge knowledge generated within the Division of Social Sciences at UCLA. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the research that I'll, I'll, I'll talk into the mic. <laughs> the research uh, that I'll be discussing today, um, as was mentioned earlier, is with Dean Darnell Hunt, who's a professor of sociology and African American studies at UCLA. And so the 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 findings I'm going to highlight um, the representation that's on screen today. But if you um, go on our website at socialsciences.ucla.edu, you can download our full report, which is the sixth annual report that looks at representation in front of and behind the camera and, and connects that to the bottom line. So um, the, the first uh, data that I'll be showing you deals with the share of film roles out there. So when we do our research, we look at the top eight credited um, film uh, roles. So we see who um, uh, of all those actors, if, what's their race and gender. And when you, look, when you see movies and when you see TV series, it's really the first eight actors that are um, receiving the most screen time. So uh, one other thing to know is that, as uh, was mentioned earlier, is that you know, there's been a lot of change. There has been um, more movies that are diverse. But you, know, you would say, well, does that really show any kind of change? And from what we've seen is that there really isn't that much change in terms of representation because at this point, the um, representation for white actors is still almost 80%. So when you put in people of color or actors of color, it's still well below proportional representation, which is about 38 to 39% for people of color. And when you look at the um, next slide, you, you see that there is a little bit more improvement in TV. And that is probably due to the fact that there are a lot more productions. There's a lot more platforms to view television series. Another, th another thing about our study is that we're um, uh, documenting scripted and unscripted shows. So we do um, you know, all the dramas and comedies as well as reality TV series. But the data that you're seeing here for TV, that um, is focused in on uh, the scripted series. So when, when you look at the people of color representation, the numbers are a little bit better than for film. However, uh, the in terms of breaking out the representation for people of color, um, it's a little bit, uh, you know, different for um, the some of the uh, ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic minority groups because, um, especially for in the case of you can see for Latinos, it's still around like five percent, and in population uh, uh, numbers, they're eighteen percent of the population. So when you look at cable, it's a, there you find a little bit more niche networks or um, networks that are targeted towards certain audiences. And uh, it's not as good as broadcast. Um, it's a little bit more similar to film. And um, the numbers, again, for uh, actors of color is, 
is not as great. And it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's still pretty similar, though, to what you're finding on um, broadcast in terms of the breakouts. So as I mentioned before, we um, include digital scripted content, so what you see on Hulu, Amazon, and on um, the YouTube scripted series. And you see that it's a little bit uh, better than cable, so it's in between broadcast and cable. And the the numbers are um, a little bit better, like for some groups, than uh, what you find, you know, on broadcast and cable, but you know, still not proportional. So then, you know, obviously there's a lot of underrepresentation, but well, like I said, we connect our research, um, our, our findings to the bottom line. So when you go back to film, you see that um, when what the data that we collect for film is we look at global box office. So what are the films out there that are doing the best at the global box office? And so when you look at the top 200 global box office films, which pretty much covers like almost all films, you know, out there that you probably have heard of, um, you find that the films that are relatively diverse are making the most profit at the box office. And when you look at the who's going to um, see these films, you see that people of color are actually overrepresented as the audience. And so you find that frequent moviegoers, according to um, the MPAA, the Motion Picture Arts Association, that um, f for frequent moviegoers, that's people that go to the movies once a month or more, that they're, people of color are almost half of that audience. Okay, so, so these are the people that are really helping the theater industry stay afloat, according to, <laughs> you know, the, the numbers. And, um, and you see that, that of the top 10 films here, um, we were able to, you know, get the data of who went to the movies in the, for the opening um, weekend at the box office. And five out of these um, 10, top 10 films had audiences that were over 50% people of color. And um, one of them was at 50%. And so then you also see that the majority of these films have casts that are relatively diverse, that are more than 20% um, minority in terms of who's in that, that, those top eight actors that I mentioned earlier. So the other findings that, that we do is that, so we break out, as I mentioned just right now, minority cash share, so, and then how that relates to box office. So we break out movies by um, if they're zero to 10% diverse, which means that, that there's really only white actors in those top eight roles. It's between 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, and then over um, uh, 50%. So what are the findings? And the findings every year we've done this study the films that do the best are more than 21% um, have, have, have a cast that's more than 21% diverse. So you see that the, the, the last year that we um, collected this data that, that was just published in uh, 2017, it was the, the highest median point was that fell between 31 and 40 percent minority cash share. So those are the films that are doing the best at the box office. So you would say, you know, Hollywood, what's the deal, right? <laughs> Diversity sells, why aren't you making more of these films? So when you look at, when you look at TV, you see um, similar findings in terms of what audiences want. So we have Nielsen data that we look at and we find that this is, this is a part one part particular table in our report, but we find that across the board, regardless of race, when you look at households that are, for Nielsen, the way that they collect data is they look at the head of households. And so you look at that um, over the years that you found that regardless of race, people want to see diverse content. 
And so when you look at 18 to 49, which is the most coveted demographic, if you look at the top 10 shows, you find that almost all the shows, eight out of 10, are, have diverse casts. And so you know, here is the, the number one, number two shows are This Is Us and Empire. So you see that people want to see diversity on screen. They want to see it re what, what they see in their daily lives reflected on screen in film and television. OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Anna Christina, for that. That was great. And for me, unexpected. Those. Okay. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Nancy Wang Yuen, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at Biola University. She's the author of Real Inequality, Hollywood Actors and Racism, and co-author of Tokens on the Small Screen, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Prime Time and Streaming Television. She's appeared on Dr. Phil, BBC World Television, Teen Vogue, New York Times, and Washington Post, among other. She is a guest writer at HuffPost, uh, Remens, Remens, I, Remescla, R Remescla um, and Al. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to just go through, I have too many slides, so I'm going to try to pick ones that are going to be complementary to uh, what Anna Christina talked about. Um, I think maybe everyone knows about Oscar So White. Do I need to go through yes. that? OK, so I'm going to skip that. I'm going to just skip that. Let's see. So yeah, this was Oscar So White. This is this year. And this is the question, oh my gosh, have we, have, are we past that, right? Because this is the first year that we had three actors of color actually win. This is a huge, I guess, you know, overthrow of the previous, but of course this is only the first year. Every time I tweet out, this is the first time so-and-so has gotten, it's kind of, it feels kind of redundant. Like we, were, we continue to kind of um, live off of these first times, which just means that, you know, everyone's like, it's 2019, how could this be the first time? And, and yet that's where we are. So it's, it's like, it's exciting. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, things are changing. But then the fact that it's the first means that we still have a long ways to go, right? So yeah, so I, in my book, this is a graphic that just, it, you know, it shows that yes, we have problems, right? This is the last time a Latinx has won. Um, 2000, this is 2001 traffic, Benicio Del Toro. And if we look at women of color, I mean, black and white, right? This is not a surprise. This is the last time uh, we had an Asian woman, the only Asian woman in the, in the 50s, win at uh, Best Supporting Actress. And then Mercedes Rule, Fisher King, this is all like what, in the 80s? And then we have Halle Berry, who is the only woman of color to ever win Best Actress, still. So um, this is a US from the USC Annenberg. And if you see that, part of the problem is that we don't have enough lead roles for people of color. So if you can't play a lead, you're never going to get an Oscar, right? So this is, I think the, the wonderful thing about Oscar So White is that it actually really pointed and exposed the kind of systemic problems we have in Hollywood. It's not just the Oscars, it's everything. It's the entire pipeline, right? And so this year, 2018, last year, is the first year that we actually are seeing you know, a little bit better. So hence the whole historic first, because we actually have you know, actually 40, um, it's still not 50%, right? We're still uh, below, but it's uh, compared to 07, uh, it's, a huge, um, it's a huge jump. And hopefully it's sustaining, but again, we're still at the first, right? So really quickly, I wanted to point out that besides, we're talking about numbers, right, and representation, but what I found, um, IMDB had a really interesting kind of um, statistic that they, that they gave out about like top paid or top grossing, sorry, top yeah. grossing actors, right? So, and I thought, oh my gosh, who is the top grossing actor? Did you know that Samuel L. Jackson is the top grossing actor of all time? He has made the best choices, right? The Star Wars, the Marvels, right? So, um, he has made, for Hollywood, $5.15 billion, right? According to his, this is actually a few years ago. This is prior to Captain Marvel and the new um, Endgame. So this is actually, he's probably at like seven billion now or something, right? Um, and so, I, I point out Mark Wahlberg because he's number 35. Not bad, right? Not bad. But guess who was the top paid <laughs> actor of 2017, right? And people will say, oh, well, it's because he's the lead, right? But I mean, 
that's another that's another issue, right? Why does he continue to get to be the lead and not Samuel Jackson when he's obviously banking, right? So he's he was thirteenth in two thousand seventeen. And if and if you look at women of color, like actually uh, Lupita Nyong'o and Zoe Saldana, right? I actually wrote a my Remes Club article was about Zoe Saldana. I mean, she's been in Avatar. She's been in you know all those Marvel films, but she's not even on the list of top paid. Right, so this is so it's even a lot worse for. So it's not so when we think about pay and equity and merits, right? The, the you know the people that earn the most money should be the highest paid, but it doesn't work like that in Hollywood. So it's just something to think about in terms of equity besides just representation, but also pay. And um, I'm gonna just skip over this part because well, really quickly, this is just <laughs> the same as what Anna Anna Christina has been talking about. Um, Latinx is the, is the best, you know, the, the 2017, they're, they're, they're the, they're, they should be like the most favored group of all Hollywood, right? Because they are, they are going to the movies like crazy. African Americans watching the most TV, this is uh, 2018 data, Asian Americans are the highest subscribers of streaming, we're, we're just couch potatoes, I guess. But, um, <laughs> but it's 19% higher than the entire population. We're also 94% of households have internet access, so we are wired. Um, and so this was a, yeah, so if you didn't see that, um, this is, I, I play this game with, with my undergrads and stuff and when I give this talk is like, you know, what do you think white households really want to see, right? And you guys already know the answer because <laughs> Christine told you it's actually, they actually want to also see more than 30%. That's, that's the highest rating, right? So that's, I think people are surprised by that. But of course, she just told me that it was head of household. So <laughs> meaning that white, a white household might have, um, they might have, you know, they might be married interracially. We don't know, right? Um, but anyway, nonetheless, this is, a, this is an important data. And same thing with Asian and black households and Latinx between 11 and 20%. So, okay, so we already know these are really, <laughs> well, these are the top. So, you know, we're, we, we're, our, our diverse content is what's driving box office, right? These are, these are the top of their, um, those last two were the top box office of, of their year. And this is, this is what the cast look like, right? We already know this. Um, Crazy Rich Asians, top, um, what was it? Uh, in 10 years, right? Top, top grossing rom-com, number 17 of that year. So um, what I wanted to bring is that um, I do um, some more qualitative content. And um, my book, Real Inequality, was really about what do actors of color, what are their experiences in Hollywood, right? Because um, I had a question of, it's like, why do you come to this research? I was really interested in why actors of color would even do what they do, because it seems like a really crappy kind of job, you know? <laughs> you can't get roles, and then when you get roles, you have to play stereotypes. So I came with it, and also being a television hound, uh, growing up latchkey kid, so I thought, you know, I wanted to know, because th these are the faces, even though as you, you know, as you do the research, you realize actors have very little say so in what kind of roles are out there, but they are the faces. And, and so I wanted to know what their experiences were like. So some of these are published. I didn't actually talk to Lucy Liu, I wish. <laughs> but she said, um, people see Julia Roberts or Sandra Bullock in a romantic comedy. Although she is, you know, she just, she was like a, in a Netflix romantic comedy. I thought, oh, she's, she's the lead, but she was actually like yeah. um, a side. What was that, what was that one called? That, that, oh yeah, I forgot. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, what was it, set it up? Yeah, set it up, so anyway. Okay, so people see Julia Roberts with Sandra Bullock in a romantic comedy, not me. You add race to it, it became, well, she's too Asian, she's too American. I kind of got pushed out of both categories. It's a very strange place to be. You're not Asian enough, you're not American enough, so it gets really frustrating. And so this is something that I saw over and over again with especially uh, the Latinx and Asian American actors that I spoke to. And, um, and I know that this, this goes beyond, I mean, also all groups of color, I think, face the kind of like the someone mentioned a double consciousness before that that the, the like how others see you how what you feel like you are and then being kind of you know not not even being able to fit into any category easily and therefore not getting casted and so um, there's actually an interesting psychology study that asked who is American Lucy Liu or Kate Winslet right this is a undergraduate psycholo psychology majors I think took this um, survey. So um, is Kate Winslet American? No. Right, so we all know that she is of the UK, right? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but of course the undergraduates all said Kate Winslet and not Lucy Liu, right? Um, but Lucy Liu, born and raised in Queens, New York, um, very American, 
but of course, this is this is the problem of perception and the kind of perpetual foreigner stereotype that Asian Americans face. But also, we were talking about this earlier. Why why isn't that Latinx are not having their moment when they are not only the biggest pop, non-white population, but also uh, the biggest moviegoers, right? And and Anna Christina talked about you know being perpetually thought of as foreign, and that that I think shapes the way that Hollywood thinks about how to market and how, what to greenlight. So not American enough, I'm gonna skip this, but B.D. Wong basically says he, he kind of trolls um, Hollywood by going to all American boy, all American casting, and he like shows up, hey! And, um, and so he, if you haven't seen this, this is, uh, this is actually, um, it's called East of Main Street, it's actually available on YouTube. It's, a, it's an entire um, documentary just interviewing Asian American actors. It's actually pretty fabulous. Okay, so, so who is this? <laughs> So really, really huge, right? Um, did you know that he changed his name? Okay, so, so oh, you can, I, I shouldn't even ask you guys. You guys are all in the know. <laughs> but he says, starting as an actor, you immediately worry about getting pigeonholed or typecast. I don't want to just go up for the dead body, the gangster, the bandadero, whatever. I don't want to be defined by someone else's idea of what Oscar Hernandez should be playing. So I use my middle name, Isaac, as my last name. So, I mean, name changing has been something that's happened in Hollywood for a while, but the fact that it still has to happen, and, and it actually worked for him, because Star Wars, you know? Um, and, and all sorts of, he's actually had a lot of great indie lead roles where he doesn't play, where he's like, where he's ethnically ambiguous. He actually played, did he play some sort of like Eastern European role yeah, recently? Armenian. Armenian, yeah. So, um, so he's not the only one, so Raquel Welch, you know, we all know that she has. Chloe Bennett had a really interesting kind of like, um, a moment of where I guess she changed, she's Hapa and she changed her name and that's when she booked, uh, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, but if you didn't know, Bennett is actually her father's first name, so she wanted to be true to, um, she didn't want to just drop her father's name and, and be done with it. So the not ethnic enough, right? Eva Longoria. Um, I didn't speak Spanish growing up. I'm ninth generation. Man, ninth generation, right? That is like, as American as that will buy. Um, I'm very proud of my heritage. I remember moving to LA auditioning and not being Latin, and that's how they say it, right, in Hollywood, Latin, enough for certain roles. Some white male casting director was dictating what it meant to be Latin. He decided he needed an accent. He decided I should have darker colored skin. So these are, these are issues that, um, like being asked, like you're being told that you're not your ethnicity enough is something that constantly they get. Uh, or can you be more Asian, which means do an accent. Right? Can you be more Latin? Can you do it? Can you, can you, and the whole broken English. Um, so America Ferrer also talks about this. She says that my first audition ever, I was about 16, casting director, can you do it but sound more Latino? Um, no idea what she's talking about. You mean you want me to speak in Spanish? No, do it in English, but just sound more Latino. I genuinely didn't realize until later she was asking me to speak English with a broken accent. So the kind of broken accent, um, uh, like, Non, you know, not nonsense English. These are things that are associated with being an ethnic, right? Um, that's how they're they're framed. And so these are the experiences of. Um, so in my, oh, I'm going to skip this too. But in my um, in my interviews, um, I also had a, an Asian American actor who actually he was asked to view a. It was a Japanese. He wanted. They asked him to do a Japanese accented English role. And he thought, okay, I'm gonna sound like Toshio Mifune. Because, you know, Toshio Mifune has this cool accent when he speaks English, or just cool, sounds cool. <laughs> and so he did it, and then the casting director was like, no, that's not a Japanese accent. And so, <laughs> and after he had studied, <laughs> and so then he's like, okay, I think maybe they just want me to do like a stereotype accent, and so he did one. And they're like, yes, that's the Japanese accent I'm looking for, right? So, so there's no school for casting directors. There's actually very little schooling for you know um, a lot of Hollywood gatekeeper roles. And so what they end up doing is just perpetuating stereotypes, right? And so and, and yet those are the ones that are making those decisions. And so we have you know we have a problem throughout the entire industry, right? It's not just kind of like the directors or the writers, but there's you know there's in my book I talk about the talent agents, right? Who's submitting the people for the roles? And, um, and, what, and someone said that, uh, it was actually, I think it was a showrunner, said that casting directors are the worst because, I mean, sorry, talent agents are the worst because they're submitting, like they asked for, I think it was a nurse's role and they only got women, right? So they, they just cannot think outside of the box, even though there's no, even if, so that's why people mention if they say, 
um, if they say only multicultural, the, the default is going to be white, right? Because unless you're specific, right? Um, unless you're specific, people are not going to be able to think outside of the box because they continue to do kind of status quo stuff. So anyway, so follow me <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> I, I tweet all the time. I am like, I, I actually like tweeted you know, the, the previous two sessions. Um, so that's, uh, so if you want to know more, also on my website you can download, um, I did do a, a report on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, uh, which is similar, so I actually worked with Darnell Hunt and Anna Christina at UCLA, so it's a similar study, but more specific. We talk, we actually look at types of characters as well, so we looked at, um, uh, so whether they're speaking with an accent or not, whether they're, you know, they have, what their names are, so we looked at things like that, and what we found with Asian Americans is that even though we're actually in television Proportional, except cable television, uh, premium cable were the worst. But everything else is actually we're at population propor proportion. But then um, we're all segregated. This is actually when I did the the black television study back in early 2000. That was exactly actually what black actors were going through. They were all on the UPNs. Remember UPN and Fox. And now Asian Americans. I mean, there's a lot more content, but they're segregated on. It was like two. It was like three shows. It was uh, Marco Polo. Um, Dr. Ken, both of those have been canceled, right? And then fresh off the boat. So, so it's like when those shows get canceled, are there shows that come in and have like 30 roles for Asian Americans, right? So if they're not, then the next year we could totally drop, right? And so, and then most of the Asian Americans were tokens. They were the only ones on their shows, which means that they have no family, they have no friends. Um, so they're not developed, they're not, no one, no one actually feels anything for those roles, right? So even if we're at population percentage, we're not, uh, we're not the roles that people actually relate to. We're not the ones that you actually, no, we're not the superheroes. Um, I mean, sometimes we are, but they're like the minor <laughs> heroes, right? And, they're, and there's only one the or two of them. Hero. Yeah, the side hero that you, <laughs> may, may, maybe you see like one parent. I think there's like that one show where there's like the kids of the, Super villains. I think there's an Asian oh, woman on that. Anyway, but there's also, oh, also we saw that there was so much content that if you're not watching, so if they're segregated on just a few shows, if you're not watching that content, then you've never seen Asian, yeah. right? So there's the, the US, USC study actually does that too, where they show like the percentages of shows that actually have an Asian. So if you look at those, those are really bad, right? So it's like, I think it's like 60, 60 almost 70% of shows don't have any Asians. So, so unless you're watching those 30%, you're not seeing them at all. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so our uh, last speaker is Dr. Monica White Ndunu, who's Associate Professor of Theater, Son Sony Music Fellow, 2017-18, and the convener of the 1918 International Black Theater Summit at Dartmouth College. 2018, what did I say? 1919. <laughs> How was it here? It's, it's been a long <laughs> quarter. Okay. The 2018 International Black Theater Summit at Dartmouth College. Um, she's also the immediate past president of the Black Theater Association um, of ATHE, the Association for Theater and Higher Education, as well as the founder and executive director of the Craft Institute a nonprofit focused on overhauling formal training across platforms to more accurately reflect national and global demographics. In addition to performing a range of roles, she has directing credits that include new works and plays by August Wilson, Entezaki Shange, and many others. She is the award-winning author of Shaping the Future of African American Film, Color-Coded Economics, and the Story Behind the Numbers. Her current book project, Acting Your Color, The Craft, Power, and Paradox of Acting for Black Americans, 1950s to the Present, is part of a multimedia project exploring black, America act, black American acting theories and practices. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have slides, so I feel like I may just want to sit here and chat with you. Okay. Um, so I think in many ways what I'm going to do is serve in the role of respondent to what we heard because I think all of our work is really in conversation. Um, and then maybe just talk about a couple of things that have been on my mind um, lately in regards to all of this. So. Um, so generally, I, I do want to say, too, I had the great honor and fortune to um, blurb Nancy's book. So I got a chance to read it before everybody else. And um, I was so excited to see it. It was definitely a more um, in-depth and nuanced 
um, view as to what's happening with actors in Hollywood, which is, um, I talk a, a bit about this in more detail in one chapter in my book, um, Shaping the Future of African American Film. The overall book, it really focuses on um, what are the color-coded economics guiding the decisions of what gets produced. Um, how much money each film um, or each project will get um, if it gets green lighted. And um, you raise the question if Hollywood knows that, you know, these films and these um, television projects are actually much more lucrative, then why are they continuing to produce the same thing? So the answer that I come to is that it's all race ideology, as much as they keep trying to say that it's really just dictated by the money. It's not. I tracked all of the money um, to see. <laughs> I tracked the money to see because I wanted to know, like, perhaps it is, and if we just make enough money that that will solve the problem, it won't. Um, because there are particular narratives that will receive financial support um, regardless, and other, others will not. And we see this um, in some of the things, even with Green Book being, you know, winning um, Best Film, which I'll, I'll circle back to. Um, Another thing that I uh, just wanted to kind of note is that, so the bridge from my first project into the second one, which focuses on acting, is really looking at um, considering that this is the paradigm that we're working in, that um, because there are, uh, there's a particular group that continues to be the gatekeepers and to control access, then what have actors done historically in order to empower themselves in that role? Because it's like, yeah, why would you want to do this job considering um, basically what's going to happen to you in the process and how have actors contended with that um, historically? And so one of the things that I'm finding, which is why I was, I'm so glad I made it in time to hear the, the previous panel, there is a really important conversation that needs to happen between these training programs and the industry itself. None of this changes unless both are, are, are being overhauled simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do we go about doing that? I'll tell you later. Uh, <laughs> So I kind of want to shift into, um, there's, how many of you had a chance to see uh, in Variety magazine, it was online a few weeks ago, Whitney Davis, um, she is a producer from CBS. She wrote an op-ed called The White Problem at CBS. Did anybody read that? Okay, I read this thing, it blew my mind. Because she basically, she spilled all the tea about what was going on at CBS. and. She did so um, at a cost to herself because they had actually, um, she had like an agreement that um, she could have taken money basically and stayed silent. She turned down the money in order to be able to tell her story about what happened there. And so basically when all of this, um, with the Me Too movement and some of the different um, uh, sexual harassments and inappropriate behaviors that were exposed, she, when they started doing an, an investigation about those things in the workplace, she had hoped that they would actually begin to investigate some of the racial discrimination that was also happening at the time. But it didn't happen. And so um, she had been there for at least over a decade and had been passed up for various promotions. But in the role of her position, she saw various casting agents or various um, people in positions of power at CBS who would either, um, they would refuse to cast black actors, like basically they, they don't have any black shows on CBS. And she explained why, like how that whole process was working. And so um, I started to think about some of the things she revealed along with, um, have any of you heard of the, the lawsuit um, by Stephen Boucher, the actor, director from um, American Conservatory Theater? Yes. If you haven't, look it up. More tea spilled. <laughs> um, but basically, he's suing ACT for racial discrimination um, against black and brown faculty as well as the students. And he details a list of, um, of wrongs that are taking place, where, whether it comes to the ways in which they construct their season, the courses, the ways in which students and faculty are racially profiled on campus, the ways in which students and faculty um, may be treated in rehearsals, um, a variety of different things. 
And so in taking those two together, and you, it's, it's very similar, the accounts of both of these people. And so you can see there's clearly a problem in both spaces that needs to be addressed in both spaces at the same time. Um, so one of the things I'm advocating through my work with the Craft Institute is working with various educational programs to, again, address these issues. And Stephen Boucher's case, sadly to say, is actually more the norm. Um, he's just, he was brave enough to actually speak out and, and sue the school. But this is how um, a lot of our um, institutions are operating, where they are not accommodating um, people of color or a range of cultures. And so um, through the Craft Institute and some of the programs that we do, like the, um, the International Black Theater Summit, what we're doing is working to overhaul the formal training programs to be more reflective of uh, the demographics of our nation and the larger world, but also to bridge the divide between how we're training in academia and what we actually end up doing um, in the industry. So I can talk more about that in the um, conversation that follows, but I think I'm at time. So thank you. So do we have questions? Uh, I'm Mark Carpenter. Um, on the data, the the I remember the the rhetoric that you know you, they don't hire black actors. Like th when Will Smith was at the top of his arc, he may still be, but but back in the Men in Black days and so forth, I remember hearing that one of the reasons they didn't cast black leads uh, proportionally was that uh, they didn't play well in Europe. Now, did, does the UCLA stats break that out? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the one that. I'm um, sorry. That. I'm, oh, it's OK. Um, yeah, so we actually, if you um, download our report on socialsciences.ucla.edu, it's you know free for everyone to download. We actually um, uh, dispel that myth. So, so internationally, and that's why like showing the glo uh, global box office that you know the the top 200 films that they do better with more diverse casts. Um, that's based on the those global box office numbers. And what we do in our report is the last two um, reports, two annual reports, we have actually pulled out the data on international markets and shown that um, that those movies do just as well internationally, but also the, the, the studios are not distributing them because they're just relying on that myth that, that you know, uh, movies with black leads will not do as well. So, so if you look at it, you know, it's only um, like a handful of movies that might get distributed to places like China. But it's like they're not they're not um, taking that you know risk, which is a, it's not even a risk anymore because they're when those movies go to China, they make like tons of money. And Will Smith actually he was the one that even showed that you know he like the studio wasn't even willing to send him to China. He went and he's like the biggest star there, <laughs> you know. So it's it, it it's like this idea that the studios have that oh um, you know Asians and like you you know you said right now you're. Europeans, oh, they don't want to see, you know, black people, they don't want to see Asian people, they don't want to see Latino, then it's like, well, you know, in China, it's like, obviously, like, they, they want to see Asian people, so it's like, you know, they're, they're the people want to see, like, like the Fast and the Furious movies, I always use that as, like, an example. That movie, if you look at the, the cast, like, you know, maybe you, you don't like the scripts or whatever necessarily, right, they're not, like, you know, Oscar worthy or whatever, but they're very entertaining films, they have made so so much money internationally because I always say that internationally everyone has somebody on that screen that they can identify with. So everyone can relate to somebody on that screen. So of course, you know, they want to go see a movie that looks like the world, you know, and that, that represents them. So those movies, you know, have made a lot of money. And that's actually another case study of like Vin Diesel that he actually has a lot of like foreign investment in the movies that he's produced because he knows that's where the money is and that that's where you're gonna like probably make the most profit, you know. And so so the 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 reports that we've done have you know I think. To, dispelled that myth and we pull out if you have any interest in international markets. Large, so you can yeah, 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 and if you if you if you want if you have any questions about it you can always email me. 
um, as well. Thank you. Can I add to that too? Um, in the research for my book, I also found that in terms of predominant, predominantly black cast films, they tend to receive lower budgets than predominantly white cast films, and they always have a higher return on investment. Um, and they make their money in the um, domestic box office like multiple times over. So we know they could be successful internationally, but they're still outperforming predominantly white cast films. And this has been the case through from as far back to the 1980s through the present. Can I also add one more thing? Uh, how much time do we have? Because I want to also give lots of people time. Okay, so I think the, the journalists actually play an interesting role because I noticed that they, um, when Black Panther went to China, they like interviewed like the few racists in China <laughs> about, awesome. yeah, and then I was like, you can go to America and like interview the, the few racists and say like that, because it did well in China, mm -hmm. but they decided to interview like the few race, the few anti-black Chinese people and, and, and report on that because they wanted to continue the narrative that people in China like are racist against black people. And, and, and interesting about the Asians though, I think Crazy Rich Asians did not do well in China, which I thought was a shock, okay. but I think it's because, um, yeah, because it's, 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 it's complicated. I think China's complicated, and we can't use the one case of Crazy Rich Asians that Asian American films won't do well in Asia, you know? But I think there was a lot of, I think it also, um, there are a lot of things about that, because it also came, it didn't, it didn't go right away, because there was censors, and then, and then so they had, or you know how China doesn't allow, you know, they only allow so many films, so it took a while for them to get Crazy Rich Asians, so it had already been out in other parts of Asia, so it wasn't new anymore, so the, the argument is that some people had already seen it pirated, yeah. um, but also that it is an American story, and we can't expect just race to be the only thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's very complicated, yeah, it's like you know? But I think, again, it's just the one. I mean, so there was so much writing on that movie, even within the community. We're like, that's not us. That's not all Asians. I mean, it's the one story. So I think we're, we're still at the point where there's narrative scarcity, right? And so yeah. we're just looking at, we're putting things under microscopes that, yeah. that, can't, that can't be extrapolated to the entire population. Yeah, and one other thing I, I also like to point out is so we collect data for the top 200 global box office films, like I mentioned earlier, but we take out the foreign language films when we um, report on it because, uh, the, the, you know, it is, there is like a, a, a different way of the, that they're distributed. But when you look at those top 200 films, it like it's ranged from like 20 something to 30 something that they're these movies that are doing really great and that they're these movies that are international that are all Asian cast. And so of those films, like pretty much almost all of them are Asian um, produced films. And so it's just showing that, you know, Hollywood by like turning their back and saying like, oh, these movies won't be profitable internationally. It's like, well, they already are because they're already out there and they're, you know, Bollywood and, you know, China and, Nollywood. you know, like there's just like tons um, of, of movies out there that are, are like, like they're, you know, competing with the movies that we're producing here and they're making more box office and they're not necessarily getting distributed in the U.S., but around the world, they're already, you know, competing with like the top, um, sometimes they're in the top 10 globally, but usually they're like, you know, and there's a, there's a handful in the top 20. Um, so, you know, there is so much money to be made out there. And, and that's where I think I was just like saying that like Asians want to see Asians because they already make their own movies, you know. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of cultural issues. Um, yeah, I think with like just the way that things are, you know, there's a lot of issues, obviously, like with, with the L Latino community and with probably the Asian American community, how things get conveyed in the U.S. and so forth. Uh, I have a question for you all. Um, so looking at the stati statistics, I'm wondering if the fantasy of the white world is what's breaking down that, not for the producers, right? It's still the Hollywood ideal, but for the audience, you know, sort of separate from a representational, I see someone like me on the screen, but the notion that an all white world is credible, even as a fiction. Um, because Hollywood really, I mean, in my research, it's like, I think Hollywood cr sort of cemented the notion that the world was white. It was the imagined space where we watched it, everyone watched it naturalized in a certain way. And, um, and I've really begun to wonder if that's cracking, 
if it doesn't work. And so that's my observation. But I, I did want to ask you about Green Book. Oh. And that, because you raised <laughs> it. You said something about it. Because there is something uncanny about that. Not uncanny, but predictable. But telling, mm -hmm. I guess, about that juxtaposition at the at the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so let me begin by saying I adore Mahershala Ali. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, baby. Um, but Green Book. Um, so <laughs> it's part of a tradition of films. Um, it's very similar to the film I write about in a book, uh, in my book, um, Driving Miss Daisy. And basically, um, Driving Miss Daisy and Green Book are an example of what I call the racial reconciliation narrative, which is more likely to get funded in Hollywood if you're going to have um, a mixed cast. It usually, you have a predominantly, um, it's a white male or a white or a white male lead. In the case of Driving Miss Daisy, it was a white woman, although she was Jewish. But it was still that. Um, there's a racial conflict that somehow is miraculously resolved by the end of the film through the personal relationships of the two people rather than any form of social justice or structural shifts, right? Um, so with Green Book, you have the same thing. And it was really telling when the film, when it won Best Film, and everybody on stage, it was all white men, and then like Octavia Butler and um, Mahershala Ali. And so there is this insistence on continuing to push that narrative, and especially in times like this. Um, but what was, what was hilarious about it is the film was supposed to be about the life of Dr. Shirley, played by Mahershala Ali. Mahershala was nominated in the Best Supporting Actor category. Viggo Mortensen was nominated in the Best Actor category, and it wasn't even his story. It tells you everything you need to know. Right, and so when people, um, and especially during award season, it always comes up now because we had, you know, 20, 2019 look different, right? So does this mean things are changing? No, they aren't. Because what, when you, you'll know it's changing when 10 years from now, we've seen a consistent level of that, but that, that doesn't typically happen. So um, just in, in looking at, um, Regina King and um, Mahershala Ali winning in the supporting categories. That is something to celebrate because they are very gifted actors. Mm -hmm. But there's also a pattern in the types of roles that are going to be celebrated. And they're usually going to be for people of color in a supporting category mm -hmm. and not the lead for all of the reasons um, that were pointed out mm -hmm. earlier. So when we come to award season and we expect to see all this brilliant change, it actually has to happen much earlier in the process, in the spaces mm -hmm. um, that Anna's talking about, that we have to, um, you have to have more films with people of color in the leads. Um, you have to have more people in those gatekeeper roles. Mm -hmm. And actually, we need to do better jobs educating people across the board, because like you noted, there's no training for the casting director. Um, for these people who have this power, we have to tell them about all of the different types of stories that can be told, and all the various cultures that need to be represented throughout their education and not, uh, we can't expect anything different because nothing that comes before it has actually changed. So that was my long answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking also of your book in regards to the distribution question and how you point out in Shaping the Future of African American Film that such films get very little global distribution, so mm -hmm. it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and then I was thinking about uh, Professor Ramon, your recent tweets on how Netflix selectively releases data. So could oh. you talk about the politics of that and talk about one day at a time? Oh, yeah. So um, yeah, well, Netflix, uh, it, was, it was in response to um, Franklin, Franklin Leonard's um, tweet about that he thinks it's a competitive advantage to Netflix by not releasing their data on like who's watching what, which is to the detriment of people like us, you know, in terms of um, championing for change in the industry and, um, you know, any other advocates that are out there. Um, because um, 
there was there was an interview that was done by Cindy Holland, who was like the head of their um, creative side, and uh, she she kind of dismissed it a little bit in terms of one day at a time, saying, "Well, we have these other shows that have you know Latinx um, people represented," and she was mentioning like this one other show that is great that shows you know young people, but it's a it's a very like uh, multicultural cast um and she was pointing to that to the fact that there was some characters in there but it's 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 uh just like what nancy was saying earlier you know it's like we, we have limited narratives and so she's just gonna say well i gave you this one other show <laughs> so be happy with it you know it's like but you know for one day at a time the fact that there was like this other data that was shown like in europe that had like so many views like eight million views or something um that Netflix released, and then you know they're saying that oh it didn't have enough of an audience. Well, you know it's just it's just kind of a little bit ridiculous because it's like a it's a multi-camera show, so it's shot in one location. It's not like um, you know a shot um, a, like on location, so it's just in the studio. And so you would think that it wouldn't be that expensive. Um, mm -hmm. And so the fact that they're saying that oh it didn't have enough audience to really um, justify continuing it, it just seemed very strange because it, it clearly had a strong enough audience that people were you know championing it on the internet. And and you know another thing that that Miss um, Holland was saying is that 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 she loved the fact that like actors on that other show um, had like um, so many followers like after their their show came on and so this you know show one day at a time was about a, a Latinx family and there's like no really other shows that are the same I mean there's Jane the Virgin that is it's in its final season it's a little bit different but there you know unfortunately are very limited shows that are for like the entire family that feature um, Latinx characters Characters and so it also obviously you know covered a lot of other themes that that people identified with and so it was just uh, just very disappointing um, because um, as also Nancy was saying Asian Americans um, ha are you know really avid um, subscribers to SVOD streaming video on demand but Latinx families are as well or Latinx individuals are as well um, and so so both you know Asian Americans and Latinx um, individuals, they are are really going to streaming video on demand. So you would think that Netflix would say, you know, oh, okay, let's you know really appeal to this audience, but they're really giving us like scraps. They're kind of like just sprinkling us all over the place. And I think the big problem with that is that they've in, they've made it public that they're investing a lot in Mexico and investing in Spanish language programming. And so they want to be given like a pat on the back, like, oh, okay, you know, um, you're good to go because now you're investing in Spanish language programming. So to them, they think that that means that they're appealing to the Latinx audience and that we should be happy with that. But um, what I always um, tell people is that if you're not familiar with this term, is that Latinx is, uh, the Latinx population is ambicultural. So the modern Latinx person is ambicultural, which means that they're 100% into the mainstream, which is, you know, uh, pretty much, you know, white America. <laughs> they're 100% they're into that mainstream culture and they're 100% into their own culture and they're comfortable going back and forth on it. So like I always tell people, they can watch a Spanish language language telenovela in the afternoon and at night they can watch Game of Thrones and so and that and it's no problem they can talk about it with their family and it's and it's something that they're completely comfortable doing and it applies to like you know other groups but especially for the Latinx market which is um, in terms of the buying power it's like the 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 biggest um, uh, ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic minority market out there. And so um, it just, you know, there's so much money being left on the table, like I always say, right? That they, that, that if Netflix and other SVOD, if they really had somebody working there that was a, a Latinx executive, I think, or, uh, you know, somebody that's in any of those departments making decisions, uh, if, if they really were an expert in the market, they would understand and I think that they would make changes. Can I ask 
ask just a brief, thank you, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, uh, can I ask a brief question about generational audiences? I'm just, you mentioned Jane the Virgin. I happen to be raising two daughters who are just entranced with that show. <laughs> and I'm very aware of this I generation, this, this um, these young uh, kids, like mine, who've grown up with tablets and iPhones all their lives, who've grown up with you know, Barack Obama as president and don't quite know what to make of you know, uh, current uh, leadership. So, um, but but that's, that's the deep structure of what they've kind of grown up with. Um, and so in thinking about, it's almost like thinking, skipping ahead, thinking, Five to ten years ahead, because I noticed uh, Professor Ramon, for example, in the in the in the demographics, mm -hmm. eighteen to forty-eight or something was a yeah. mm -hmm. But what about those ten to eighteen-year-olds uh, who are coming up, who, are, right. who will very very soon be, uh, you know, commercially viable audience members? Who, uh, is there any any sort of projection about this very unusual uh, group that seems to be coming up? Yeah, well, I think that I think they mentioned that earlier in the panel. And then, in terms of yes, that, that they um, most of them are not watching, uh, you know, TV shows, broadcasts, television, especially. But they're watching um, things on YouTube, and you know, and they're definitely more familiar with YouTube than like most of us adults in terms of like you know who's popular. But um, that we haven't seen that necessarily translate to um, popularity, and and you know, in in other in these other bigger you know platforms um, because maybe because of the development executives you know they are trying to get the most popular YouTube stars to to get a deal but you know that's it's still I think an area that is is so large because you know there's so many personalities but yeah it's definitely a question that's coming up um, and one other thing I wanted to know is that you know with the the film data that I was showing um, a, a lot of you know the the idea is like, oh, well, maybe it's only like older people going to the movies because there is like this, you know, notion that young people are not, are, are more just like on the internet all the time, right? But when I asked the MPAA to give me um, this data that I wasn't able to get into the report, but you see that, and, and this is something that they actually have in their MPAA report, but I broke it out by demographic. And I was able to see that the largest audience for each demographic group was in the 18 to 25 range. So you think like, oh, you know, young people, they don't have time for the theater, the movie theater. They're just, you know, doing I don't know what, right? <laughs> and so, but they're actually going to the theater. They're the biggest audience. So these are, these, this is a generation of, that's probably very diverse, very, you know, have, has mixed ethnic, ethnic um, background. You know, their, their friends are probably very diverse and so forth. And they're still going to the theaters. And so, you know, they should get Get, um, uh, content that appeals to them. They should be seeing things that appeal to them. And so, so you know, if you're going to say like, oh, it's probably that the old people are going to theater. Well, yeah, they they are. But the people, the younger people, they're the ones that are, you know, actually going more than than the other older groups. Consumer drop off for so just looking at uh, television children's entertainment is characteristically probably since like the late 80s through the 90s uh, much more diverse right from Sesame Street to I mean it's kind of tokenized with Power Rangers like all the Disney Disney Channel stuff yeah. all the Nickelodeon stuff but there is a lot of very intentional uh, diversity there and of course. What I've always wondered, and also as I watch my nieces grow up, like, is there a drop off? Have they gone to YouTube after they've come of age and they've outgrown the children's programming and are looking for these other avenues? Probably because it was federally mandated. There was federal guidelines for children's programming. So that's why it is, it is more diverse, basically from the 80s, like, you know, on, like, or at a certain point. That you know in the 80s, and so so that is definitely true. But yeah, the, I I haven't seen anything directly about like what happened after they you know maybe they're five years old and they just go to just YouTube, um, just because it's so recent. Uh, and 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 like I said, broadcast TV is more diverse. So I don't know if still when they're like 
12 or 13 or you know if they're watching Nick, Nick, Nickelodeon and all those other live action shows um, those are also very diverse still so yeah I, I, that's a good question though I don't know if you guys have an answer <laughs> Um, I, I did some research on YouTubers and for my book, and I had noted that um, you, so there was a study that came out on YouTubers diversity, top YouTubers versus top, I guess, celebrities, and it was such a huge difference where top subscribe YouTubers are so much more di so much more inclusive of women and people of color than, um, and so the, the, the survey was of that demographic of like the teen and tween, and they were, and so they, you know, they're, they're gravitating to people that look like themselves, because if you didn't know, um, research shows that there are more, pe more kids of color in elementary schools, like just more enrolled in elementary school and more babies of color being born, so, so we are, we we, th that demographic is just, it's not white. And so, um, I mean, I have um, kids and, uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, and so I think about, I mean, what are they watching? I mean, they, they one of them likes to stream um, uh, Fresh Off the Boat and Blackish on Hulu. And then the and then the other one just watches um, like K-pop dance routines yeah. on and practices. And my older one thinks she's going to be a K-pop star. Even when, even when I tell her we're not Korean, um, <laughs> and uh, you should just learn Chinese. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I think it, it, so internationally, right? But we haven't talked about K-pop. I mean, this yeah. is like you you think like young people who aren't Korean are learning it phonetically. There's there's there's, um, it's, it is a different kind of media world, um, and that K-pop, something like K-pop that I think when I was growing up, like, music from Asia was seen as, like, not great, you know, like, from, for, for someone who was Asian American, because nobody cared about that, right? But my kids, like, their non-Asian friends are, are into Asian okay. music, which makes, which makes the identity kind of the whole... Um, what Doreen mentioned about seeing yourself. It's like, I don't care about K-pop, but I just like that they exist, yeah. right? Like, I think that they do a, a great service for the young people today. Yeah. <laughs> it's like their, sim their symbolic like existence cool. yeah. is is so important. That's why I'm a sociology friend who's Korean American and is he studies hip hop. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Ju Ju Young, and he was just like, I hate that music, but I think that they're doing so much to make Asian men look <laughs> sexy, you know, and young Asian men. So it's so the, the kind of, um, I mean, I don't even, that's not even the answer to your question, but the drop off, I think it's, it's more like there's just so much content out there. Yeah. We can't actually even measure where these kids are going to because they have so much choice yeah. that um, I think it's gonna look like a different media world because I think that's part of the reason why, again, why we have so much diversity because there's just so much more content with different business models, right? The whole niche thing that was mentioned earlier that, that they don't need to appeal to the, the middle American audience anymore that television has, broadcast television has traditionally um, and some and cable now they can like go for the niche but then it's like the hypocrisy of like you know one day at a time i don't get it because yeah. we did everything right on social media right the whole save one day at a time and it didn't work and what bothered me was that they can't even go elsewhere because of their strange yeah. locked in contract with exactly. netflix and i was like netflix isn't all that you know yeah. <laughs> but then they also but then you can't leave yeah. <laughs> it's like you're trapped anyway so yeah, my only research is with my children as well, <laughs> so <laughs> in regards to that. But I think these are really important questions, and I think that is where um, content creators should really be targeting that age group. I think that's where the shift, where the major change is going to happen going forward, which is why I'm always talking about education, especially the pipeline from one stage of education to the next. Um, so really focusing on building on the fact that they've been exposed to a diverse um, uh, content as smaller children. Because what happens as they get older, it's almost like the industry is force feeding them whiteness. You're going <laughs> to take it whether you want it or not. That's, you know, with the, the type of programming that they're getting. And so I think if we can find a way around that, and I think we can, this is, I, I tell my students, I tell anybody who will listen, this is one of the best times in the history of the world to be alive and be an artist because the gatekeeping cannot happen. It, it, it's impossible for them to block us in the same ways that they have historically. So if we can really tap into that and look at those things, you know, gravitate to the things that they are finding on YouTube. And the other thing is encouraging um, children to create their own work. 
that in itself is going to create a whole new um, approach to the craft and the types of work that we're exposed to as audiences. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, and it's lunchtime. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you.